Hello and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Matt Smith. I'm the Director of Training at Corvell. And today we'll be discussing a new partnership between Corvell and the Reed Group in which we're combining workers' compensation and absence management to provide an integrated solution for disability management. Just a couple of quick announcements. We are recording today's call, so all the attendee lines are muted. However, we are happy to take your questions. I'd like to direct your attention to the Q&A pane, which you should see in the lower right hand of the screen. Uh, our Senior Vice President of Sales, Denise Meyer, will be monitoring the Q&A pane during the call, and she'll be posing questions to our presenters. We'll address as many questions as possible today. So I'm pleased to introduce our presenters for today. Our Chief Marketing Officer, Diane Blaha, and the Reed Group's VP of Head of Sales, John Lemire, as they review the benefits of our partnership and the impacts on cost, productivity, and employee satisfaction. John is the Head of Sales for Reed Group. He has over 30 years combined occupational and non-occupational disability experience. John spent 28 years at Liberty Mutual. His first 10 were spent in workers' compensation claims. And in 2000, John joined Liberty's group disability claim operations and for several years had the overall responsibility for Liberty's IDM operations. John also served as chief claims officer for Liberty Group's claims in 2015 and 2016. The remainder of John's career has been spent in various sales and service management roles focused on large complex companies. Diane is the senior vice president and chief marketing officer at Corvell. She has more than 30 years of healthcare experience, beginning her career as a registered nurse, and then spending the last 20 years in workers' compensation claims and managed care. She is a member of the American Heart Association and the Women in Business Coalition. Diane earned her Master's of Science in Nursing degrees at the College of St. Francis. And now I'm pleased to hand it over to our presenters to begin the presentation. Thank you, Matt, and welcome to all of you who have joined us today. Why to even uh, talk about integrated disability management? For those on the phone, absence today for the American employer costs the employer anywhere between $1,600 to $3,600 a year per employee. So really focusing on absence and how to better manage the cost associated with absence is critical to many employers who are trying to make sure that they can remain functional in the market and competitive in this space. That's really the purpose of an IDM program. So what's included in an integrated disability management program? It really talks about a consistent experience for the employee. It will often combine the following components, workers' compensation, short-term and long-term disability, leave of absences, and ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. We really focus on reporting, disability duration, return to work opportunities, ADA compliance, and FMLA tracking. If you go to the next slide, Matt. So how is this important and how does it benefit both the employer and more importantly, the employees? Remember, we're trying to make sure that the employer and the employee get the service, get the care, get the treatment they need, so we can minimize the exposure to absences. The initial or the first point of contact is critical to make sure that we give them a good positive experience and we have that single point of contact. One of the reasons that the Reed Group and Corvell partnered is that we both have the same philosophy on clinical oversight, clinical management. So really looking at what we can do to help that employee as they go through the continuum of medical care to return them to their pre-injury uh, or pre-incident uh, point of health and get them back at return to work. Next, we want to make sure that we have similar return to work focus, whether it's an occupational injury or a non-occupational injury. It's important to be able to have a program that you can um, access as an employee, whether your injury or illness is related to something occupationally or non-occupationally. Having transitional duty that you can access or use for any employee who can return to the workspace or the workplace is then considered more consistent as well as impacting the absenteeism and the productivity for those employers. 
lastly, you want to be able to have some type of integrated reporting. And why is that valuable? You want to understand, do you have longer absences or disability durations on the occupational side or on the non-occupational side? Where are there opportunities for improvement? And if it's working on one side, occupational or non-occupational, can you apply those same principles, those same techniques on the other side of the house so that you have really a very structured and tight program that really does help stay and keep your employees conditioned? If you go to the next slide, Matt. <clears throat> we talked about the single point of intake, and this varies. Oftentimes, it could be online, it could be through a call center, perhaps it's filling out forms. But we want to make that user experience as easy as possible, and we don't want to say to the injured worker, is this occupational or non-occupational? We really want to be able to give them access to be able to report or request a leave of absence. So the first place we look at, obviously, is a dedicated toll-free number for phone calls. We can then use the customer care team to determine which, uh, where they need to go and who they need to talk to. For the occupational side, we look at the nurse line or uh, uh, triage uh, for Corval, that's advocacy 24-7. Oftentimes, we may want to be able to offer a web portal. So we want to be able to direct your employees to be able to go to one single portal and then be able to determine whether they need to go for an occupational support and request or non-occupational report and request. We want to be able to have the data exchange with the client so that they have a full understanding of who's not at work today, who's not going to be at work tomorrow, and when you can anticipate those employees to come back to work. If you go to the next slide, Matt, and this just kind of isolates the occupational side of the intake process. The event occurs, your employee is injured, and it needs to be reported. Many of the clients that we work with today, that will start with the nurse triage advocacy 24-7 piece. But it could also be reported by phone, by either the injured worker or the supervisor or manager. It can, report, it can be reported online, or it can be reported strictly to the employer who then sends information or documentation to Corvell. At that point in time, we can decide, is it occupational or non-occupational? If it's occupational, it goes through Corvell and starts in the process. If it's the read group, it then go, if it's non-occupation, uh, oh, then it goes to the read group. The value of the integration at this point is that that information exchange can take place between the read group and Corvell. Perhaps they have a wraparound policy, perhaps FMLA information. We want that information to flow so that we'll avoid duplication of effort, discussions with the, injured, with the employer or the employee, and make it, again, a seamless process. At this point in time, I'm going to pause and turn it over to John from the Read Group. John? Thanks, Diane. Uh, so on the left-hand side, those two process slides, you know, it's not intended that you'll be able to read those. Um, but really what the point is, is that we do have formal processes and documentation behind the scenes, uh, system connectivity. And so a lot of the stuff Diane talked about, but really what the most important piece of our relationship is that employee experience. So, um, Diane mentioned this a minute ago, but one of the things that's important to understand with a client uh, where a short-term disability is involved is how short workers' compensation is, um, what is it, how is it considered by short-term disability? Is it an exclusion or is it an offset? So that's an important piece of, of the understanding of the pro policy because it, that'll trigger different processes depending on how that, um, how disability plays into workers' comp. So Matt, if you could just hit the slide. So this is just kind of a blow up of the employee experience, but one of the things that's really important, Diane mentioned it, is real-time updates. So uh, to Diane's point, when a claim comes in in workers' compensation and uh, the FMLA claim will be automatically created and adjudicated on our side, well, we have uh, all the eligibility information and we can easily uh, 
approve that uh, FMLA claim using workers' compensation as the proxy. So the employee does not have to go out to get the medical certification filled out, and it's you know, obviously much easier on the employee. We will get, uh, with that connectivity we have with Corval, we'll know start and stop date. So if, if workers' compensation stops before they've exhausted FML, we will close the FMLA leave accordingly. When short-term disability is involved, this is where I think the biggest value comes into play, especially if workers' compensation is an exclusion for short-term disability. So in a situation where an employee has filed an occupational claim and it's determined that it was not work-related, either not in the course and scope of employment or um, some other condition that's not covered under workers' compensation, Regroup will automatically get a trigger when that claim is denied to create the short-term disability claim. So the, the benefit there is, and, and you may have seen this in your uh, in the past, where you have different vendors, one handling occupational disability and one the other handling non-occupational, is sometimes the employee is stuck in the middle, right? Because workers' compensa compensation is saying it's not work-related, and the non-OC non -OC vendor is saying, well, provide all of that proof that it isn't work-related before we start paying you. And that's not the intent, right? The employee should be eligible for one or the other. So immediately upon that denial, Regroup will get a, um, a trigger and we'll create the short-term disability claim. We'll leverage the medical information that Corvell has in their system, so sharing of uh, information. So again, the employee is not required to go down and track down any uh, medical information, we'll use that medical information to make the decision on short-term disability to approve that. And so those two claims will be linked. And so if, if in the uh, future that employee's claim is overturned and they are now eligible for workers' compensation, we'll handle that, um, uh, we'll handle the buckets appropriately and, and close the short-term disability claim and, and talk about the whole uh, the piece of uh, potential overpayment or um, or uh, trying to get back the, the money paid from the short-term disability policy. The other piece is if it's an and, so if, if short-term disability workers' compensation is uh, an offset, same thing will happen. When the workers' compensation claim is approved, we will get a trigger uh, to understand exactly how much the employee is getting paid, which we will then use to offset the short-term disability um, plan. And so as benefits change, as benefit, or if uh, the employee gets, goes back to work, we'll again get a trigger to either adjust benefits or close that short-term disability claim accordingly um, with a return to work. So all of that is automated in the system. Again, the, the big piece is that employee experience. The other piece, that comes into play is long-term disability. Most policies, long-term workers' compensation is an offset in long-term disability. So to have a process in place where we can identify those claims that are still open, that are approaching the long-term disability elimination period, to have a process in place to make sure that the long-term disability claim is set up with the appropriate vendor, uh, to ensure that the employee is getting all of the benefits they're entitled to under the long-term disability policy, including Social Security disability. And uh, the final piece on this is um, we talked about the shared medical information, and so that's a big benefit again in the employee not with the employee not having to track down uh, duplicate information. So Matt, next slide. So Diane touched on this a little bit, but um, it's important just to reiterate this. So workers' compensation will drive the process for integrated events. So on an approved workers' compensation claim, the employee has one point of contact. That's the workers' compensation claims adjuster. Um, again, we talked about the elimination of duplicate paperwork in, this, in the situation of family medical leave, uh, leaves or uh, short-term disability claims and then uh, the coordination of benefits between uh, workers' comp and SD when workers' comp is an offset. So um, next slide. So in terms of the life of a non-occupational claim, you'll see this is very close to an occupational claim that Diane will talk about next, but Diane mentioned when uh, with one single intake number, when it 
comes when the call comes in, if the employee does note that it's not work related, we will have a transfer to the regroup intake process. Uh, they'll they're able to do it via phone, web, or mobile to initiate it. We will do an automatic eligibility check, send out the appropriate paperwork. Our system has automated reminders, um, consistent, and we'll, we'll obviously, um, from a case management perspective, our, our non-occupational claims, as Diane mentioned, it's very similar to occupational claims, right? How can we get this person back to work as, as quickly and as safely as possible? And uh, with, it, with Americans with Disability Act support, or other return to work options uh, with the goal obviously of returning to work. And as I mentioned, in those situations where the employee is not gonna go back to work during short-term disability and, and LTD is, um, they're probably gonna go into LTD, we, will, we work with uh, the insurance carriers. Most employers, as you know, have fully insured long-term disability plans with insurance carriers. We work to make sure there's an integrated seamless process from that point as well, from the transition to STD to LTD. So again, focus on the employee experience. It may be two different vendors, but our goal is to make it very seamless to the employee. So Diane, I'll turn it back over to you to, to talk about the occupational process. You're on mute. Sorry, John, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Very similar to the um, uh, uh, non-occupational process is um, our process. And that is, as we've said, the employee gets injured. And really, the focus on our program, as most of you know who work with Corvell, is really a health-driven model. We want to do, we want to take care of that injured worker first and foremost. So within minutes of the injury, we want them on the phone with the nurse to be able to determine which is the best level of care. We want to give them complete access to care immediately. Remember, the basis of an IDM program, the basis of what we're talking about today, is really trying to make sure that we take care of those injured workers, we take care of those employees, and we get them back to work as safely and quickly as possible once they get the care that they've received. So once they go through that, they'll then be determined, or will be determined, I should say, um, the level of care that they need uh, to treat whatever injury or illness they sustained based on the workplace injury. It will then go through the process of claims management. So we do things a little bit different. We don't do the claims management at the beginning. We really take care of that injured worker, which really does align nicely with an IDM program. It then goes through the normal process of determining compatibility, adjudicating the claim, and doing all of the details that go along with that. We manage the care and the cost so that we get the ultimate outcome, which is the quality care the injured worker deserves and needs, and return to work, whether it's transitional or full duty. So those are all the components of an occupational claim. Again, kind of brief, there's a lot of details that go behind, but the reason for John and I having both of these slides is to really show you how similar these processes can be and should be. It doesn't matter how your employee is injured or how they're hurt or how they're, why they're not coming to work. It matters more on getting them taken care of, returning them to work, and then dealing with all of the, the details that go behind it. If you go to the next slide, a huge component, as we've mentioned before, is the return to work coordination. Again, oftentimes, and we see it day in and day out with many employers, and I, I, if I could look through the screen of the, the webinar, I'm sure there are some employers that are shaking their heads. You've got a very robust transitional duty on the occupational side of the house, but perhaps not as robust or even the same program on non-occupational. So if you're out of work because you tore your rotator cuff based on lifting boxes on the work site, or you tore your rotator cuff playing basketball over the weekend, we should, as an employer, be able to offer that injured worker the same opportunities to stay at work or return to work in a transitional duty position. We want to be able to make sure they stay conditioned, they stay fit to be able to return to their job, and psychologically they stay fit mentally that they are producing, they're contributing, and they're part of the world today. So, we work a lot with return to work accommodations. 
We work a lot making sure they fall under ADA. And we also work on coordinating opportunities to return these folks back to work. If you go to the next slide, and John, please feel free to jump in. I know we've talked about a lot of these things, but we want to be able to integrate the reporting. And what does that look like? So we can't really do costs, right? Because obviously there's several health plans. The cost of medical care is visible in the occupational space and not as visible in the non-occupational space. But there's a lot of reporting that can be done so that you can adjust your program. You can look for opportunities of synergies. And that you can also look for opportunities to improve programs, whether it be on the occupational or the non-occupational side. So one of the first things and most important things to look at is disability duration. Again, let's go back to the employee that tore their rotator cuff playing basketball or lifting boxes while working. Shouldn't they, if they have the exact same injury, the exact same comorbidities, the exact same care and treatment, expect to have the same disability duration off of work for the same period of time. They both have to return to the same job, requiring the same essential job uh, requirements. So their disability duration should be the same. If you looked at your disability duration today, would it be um, pretty similar on both sides of the house? In other words, do your rotator cuff repairs or tears have the same length of disability duration? Is one a little bit longer than the other? How well is it being managed? And we also want to look at frequency. Is your frequency um, standard, normal, and is it going up or down as the years go by? And then lastly, we want to look at trends. Are you an aging workforce? Do we see some of the same challenges on the occupational side that perhaps you have on the non-occupational side? And can programs impact both results on both sides. Those are the kinds of things that you can glean from that integrated reporting. And when I say integrated reporting, it's not running 50 million reports being uh, piled with stacks of paper on your desk and trying to get through it or glean through this information. That's the responsibility of folks like us in this type of IDM program. We want to be able to look at these analyses identify these types of trends, and then work collaboratively to come up with solutions to impact your total cost, your total care, and again, bottom line, your absenteeism and the cost that's associated with that. So John, let's talk a little bit about the value of an IDM program. Take it away. Sure. All right, thanks, Diane. So one of the, thing, one of the things I wanted to talk about before we jumped into this slide is, um, a lot of times there's this hesitancy to to put a, an IDM program together where you have situations where risk management and uh, benefits are, are separate, right? Separate decision makers. And that shouldn't prevent the discussion about IDM. It's really the employee experience. The reporting doesn't, to, to Diane's point, we could put it together, we can keep it separate. But I think the big piece, what we want to think about here is that employee experience and the consistency in the experience, be it a non-occupational claim or an occupational claim. So that's a big piece of, of understanding, I guess, or thinking about this program, think about it that way. Um, and we talked about the employee experience up in the top with uh, online tools, the ability to, to work with employers to accommodate return to work, different processes, uh, working in the large case space, we know that all employers are different. They have different um, different hierarchies, different structures, et cetera, multi-location employers. So we want to make sure that we're working um, with the employer to make sure that employee experience is as seamless as possible. Diane talked about the return to work focus, and I think that's a big piece of talking about the total cost savings and the lost work days, right? So in many situations, we see a very, to Diane's point, a very robust occupational return to work process, and there's a huge opportunity on the non-occupational side to uh, put a similar process in place. In those situations, you may see a very big increase in savings, right? You could have average reduction of 20, 25% or more. A lot of it really depends on where the employer is or where you are in terms of your non-OC outsourcing, where you are in the continuum. Do you have a very ro a robust process in place? Do you have uh, 
good case management, aggressive case management in place, return to work focus. And so, you know, we have some clients who have all that in place and, and really the, there is some administrative savings there, but really, again, it's the employee experience. And then we have some customers and employers who have just really started to put processes around their non-occupational disability and managing return to work. And there, there's a huge opportunity in those situations. So I think the, the point is there's a big opportunity. You know, you don't have to think about it being the, the nirvana of IDM being one decision maker and all the integrated reporting. It really is that employee experience and the support that both of our programs provide in getting your employee back to work as uh, safely and uh, quickly as possible. So next slide. So we're at questions now. And so um, Denise is going to monitor and ask questions to Diane and I. Do we Excellent. have any, Denise? Yes, absolutely. So I guess one of the real big questions, of course, is what is the cost and how is this um, distributed to the employer? So, how, so I'll, Diane, I'll st oh, you're on mute again. Nope, go for it. You're fine. Go for it. Um, so, you know, from our standpoint, both Corvell and Regroup, we look at we look at the employer's experience right separately. Um, there's many frequency, duration, severity, et cetera. And look at the opportunity of us coming together in an, in an integrated program. So at the you know so at the beginning of our relationship, they really do stand on their own. And our hope is through this integration and the results and the savings and the uh, reduced uh, duration days, et cetera, there is an opportunity to improve the experience, which obviously then improves uh, the price to the employer. And I think, John, what varies or difference between our two organizations and how we price is that um, really on the occupational side, it is fee for service. It is based on experience, absolutely, but it is more of a fee for service, what is delivered. And on the non-occupational side, it's more per employee per month type of fee. Yeah. And the next question. Do they take into consideration past history of injury for the patient? Diane, you want to start yeah, with that on the comp side? I was yeah, figuring I that that comes up a lot on the comp side with aggravation and reoccurrence. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think that is one of the things that we look at is comorbidities, right? We want to understand comorbidities. And I think, and, and maybe that's the nurse part of me that comes out a little bit, John, so bear with me. But I think the healthier the, the workforce is, the better results that clients will see uh, in both the occupational and non-occupational spaces. Really, everything is kind of dependent on each other, right? So we want to keep the employee um, workforce healthy. That's what you do a lot through your health programs. But if we're able to have these programs, uh, we see that your exposure in the work comp side is less. But absolutely, we take into consideration the past history of the injury for the patient. Was it aggravated? We've got state laws that help guide us in some of that. Um, but those are all kinds of things that we also can measure. And as we get into more detailed reporting and analytics are more things that we'll take into consideration that may be beneficial to an employer in a general overall space. So I think if you look at IDM, and I'll get off my soapbox here in a second, John, and you can respond. <laughs> but I think we really, it's a way to start looking at the employee population in a holistic manner. So it doesn't matter how, why someone can't come back to work, kind of similar to the opening remarks, it's how do we make sure our workforce is healthy, is safe, and then using an IDM approach to be able to make sure we take care of them no matter the, the root cause, but also to be able to use that data and information to improve both the health and the safety of the workspace. So with that, John, I'll turn it back to you and let you respond. Yeah, so thank you, Diane. So um, I think, you know, the point that you made is very important under workers' compensation, right, with in terms of compensability, every jurisdiction is different in terms of an aggravation or reoccurrence. The positive piece, or at least the benefit of having this integrated uh, program I mentioned earlier is if that person does have a flare-up that isn't covered as under workers' compensation for whatever reason and the claim is denied, 
will start the short-term disability claim immediately. And in the short-term disability world, really past injuries uh, don't really factor in as what they do in workers' compensation. They are comorbid to Diane's um, point. And so we try to manage that person holistically back to work, taking into consideration um, most individuals we see who go on and claim have at least one comorbid condition that can impact return to work. Thank you. We have another question here. Do you conduct the interactive process meetings under ADA and send confirmation letters to employees who are off work for an extended period of time? So I'll start first on the non-oxide. So we do work with the employer uh, in the interactive process, uh, gathering the medical information, looking at the essential functions of the job. And uh, it really depends on employer. We have some who want us to send that um, letter directly to the employee, summing up what uh, the conversation is and what the opportunity is for them to return to work or not. Uh, some employers want to do that themselves internally. So that's something that can be customized based on employer. Yeah, and very similar on, on the Corval side as well, when we run into that space, yeah. Thank you. Does the employer have a dashboard access for non-OC health to see the status of the leave, dates, et cetera? Yes, for non-OC, we have a, an employer self-service portal, which provides um, trending information, detailed information. We work with the employer through the implementation to identify what reports they need, when they need them, do we have a system integration with a, a, an HRIS system or a, a payroll system. So yeah, we uh, there's a lot of access to information on, on the non-OX side. Denise, do we have any other questions? Yes, thank you. Does the IDM offer or require a multi-party contract client read Corval in the event we have an existing relationship with one of the providers? And can this be accomplished with the two separate contracts, client read, client Corval? John, do you want me to start off? Yeah, yes, please. So great question. Um, for those of you on the phone that are already working with Corval, or for those of you on the phone already working with the read group, yes, absolutely, we can have two separate contracts. One of the things that for new clients or potential clients, we want to make it as simple as possible. So we do have the flexibility of offering you one contract with uh, both Corval and Reed, and we'll use each other as subcontractors. Or again, at your request or preference, we can have two separate contracts. Uh, anything to add, John? No, I think you summed it up well, or answered it well. Yep, absolutely. Is there any integration of the account management role? So, <laughs> go ahead, John. Go, so, if I'm, we do have, only, a, I think I'm only smiling because these are the same questions we asked ourselves that we started working together exactly. a couple of years ago. <laughs> so, I think it really depends on that point I made earlier. Is there one owner of both programs, and the need to see that um, all you know, holistically together in that situation. Yes, there should be one point of contact and we would uh, most likely defer to uh, the Coraval account executive team with support on the non-oxide from ours. Uh, if they're two separate programs, we just have the integration between the two. Unless an employer wants something different, we would have an account executive on the non oc and then an account executive on the occupational side. Yeah, I, I really, I, I think that's absolutely right, John. We really look to the client, what is your preference? Um, we can certainly accommodate, we've worked with our team so that our teams are really up to speed on things and we wanna give them resources. Even though you may have one account management, there's a lot of folks behind each one of those account managers to really support the program. It, it really is your account team. But we also recognize and we respect that oftentimes folks just want one point of contact. But as John said, if you're still managing from two sides of your of your uh, company, maybe HR and risk or legal, uh, and you want to have two separate account managers, we'll make sure those two folks work well together. 
and make sure that there we, we do and we are offering a, a, an entire holistic integrated program. What about returning an employee to work after an injury or absence? They have a permanent condition that does not allow them to return to work in the position they were hired for. Do you have to create a new position for them? John, you want to start or take that one, I should say? Sure. I mean, uh, so with the Americans with Disability Act, it's, you know, a little bit uh, squishier than it used to be, right? So. Um, on the non-OC side, obviously, we look at the essential functions of that job and are, are they able to, to still perform the essential functions of that job and, you know, can the employer accommodate? So there's a lot that goes into that. Um, I, I probably don't want to get into too much detail. Our compliance people are better at answering that. But, you know, on the non-OC side, there is that you know, the assessment to see if there is some opportunity to, to bring the person back. Okay. Diane? Yeah, yeah, and I would say very similar on, on the occupational side, John. It really does, um, you know, you have to look at it that you want to have to, or you have to make this person whole. And what can we do, obviously, on the occupational side? Uh, can they look for a similar position outside? Because you want to be able to, to figure out something to get them back to work so that the claim can be resolved. But Again, having to really work with ADA and accommodations and what's best for the claim and for the client. Thank you. What does the communication channel look like between the employer and read group for non OC health leave? So, uh, for non occupational leave, so we have a, a number of different ways to uh, omni channel, omni channel approach to communicating with. Uh, employers, so uh, a lot of discussion happens during the implementation process in terms of their hierarchy. Do they have a decentralized model where they want the supervisor involved, or is it a more of a centralized model? So we will work all of that. We have the ability to do email. We have the ability to do reporting. Uh, to the employee, we have the ability to do text. So uh, a lot of that really depends on when the employer wants and needs the information. And, and um, you know, we have some clients who get information for every status change because that's, you know, part of their workforce management plan is to understand, you know, what's going on on a daily basis so that they can staff. So uh, we have a lot of options that are customizable to, uh, to each employer in their situation. Thank you along with service contracts and performance guarantees. I'm not sure what the question is there, Denise. Can you- I actually believe they're asking if we do, um, along with our service contracts, do we offer performance guarantees is my, my, my guess on that. So today, I'll, I'll speak for the non ox side. Yes, most employers, if not all customers that have performance guarantees around timeframes, quality, et cetera. Um, and so, depending on, again, depending on if it's a fully integrated pro, um, product with one decision maker, you know, I, I'll turn over to Diane to talk about performance guarantees on the occupational side, but I would. I would think we would be open to, to coming up with something that would encompass both the OCK and the non OCK. Yeah, absolutely, John. So on the Corval side, traditionally today, we do often engage in performance guarantees related to things like implementation, total cost of risk and reduction thereof. Um, we also get into some task-based performance guarantees. But I think in situations like this, oftentimes, and I also think that performance guarantees are sometimes a, a guarantee that the same errors that the, a client has had in the past won't be uh, re, redone, <laughs> right? So, but I think for, for an IDM program, it really will take some conversation. It sounds like, you know, and I don't want folks to walk away from this discussion saying, boy, we got, you know, Corval and Reed has everything just kind of put into the right place. A lot of this is that we're, um, we want this program to work for our, the clients that engage with us. So there is some customization, and that customization isn't based on what's happening. It really wants to be based, on, or we should base it on what's going to be the needs of your population. If this is where you really want to be able to look at reducing absences, 
you want to be able to um, make it a better user experience. Let's talk about what kind of performance guarantees you're looking to make sure that you're setting your goals and you're achieving those goals. And we all have skin in the game, right? So whether it's the discussion or the communication on making sure we've got concurrent FMLA for our, an occupational injury, or whether we're um, exchanging information or medical information when there's a wraparound benefit or other um, components of a program, those are things that are really easy to talk about. And then easy, uh, what I also think is people don't, uh, change is challenging, right? So oftentimes talking about implementation uh, performance guarantees. What are the standards? What are the milestones? Can we meet them? Let's make sure that we're all in this process together. Thank you. What lessons and challenges do we need to be aware of when integrating one or more programs? Oh, I, I, at least for me, John, maybe I'll start. I, I, a okay. lot of it comes with understanding you and your company, your organization, your goals, um, and setting level expectations of what we can do. And making sure that we set those goals and, and really have milestones to how to measure those goals. I think it's really trying to work together to identify where you're trying to go and how this program can get you there. Um, that for me is really an investment of time and a commitment to understanding what capabilities and functionality we have in place, or what we can develop, and what you really will resonate best with your uh, employees. And John, something to add with that? Well, I was going to say, I think you, you said it very well. It's, it's, you know, what are you trying to accomplish as a company, right? There's short term and long term. Where are you in the continuing of outsourcing? You know, do you have a program that is um, very well ingrained within your organization or is it something new? Are you changing your philosophy on managing benefits? So it really is, to, I, I like that point Diane made. It's really taking the time to step back and say, okay, what's in front of us right now? But really, where do you want this program to go in the end? Because you know, there's certain things you can do short term, but you really need to look at that five years, six years out. If if, if you have an understanding or a, a sense of what that looks like as the workforce is changing. Many things can change a lot quicker than they used to, but that to me is the biggest piece is really the planning and the continued conversation, using the data information reporting to help make sure you're on track to, to what that ultimate goal is. Thank you. You mentioned when there is a work comp claim, work comp drives the IDM. Are the work comp claim adjusters trained, trained in FMLA laws? Do they talk with the injured employees when an employee has FMLA questions? So I, I'm not sure I said their uh, work comp drives, but, and, and maybe that is an accurate statement, but it really is, we've got an exchange of, um, we have a, a very cool system between the two organizations so that for FMLA hours on indemnity work comp claims, we're, we're exchanging that information with the read group so they can track the FMLA. Now, actually managing the FMLA would go to the read group, unless, John, you've got a different thought on that? No, I mean, if there's a, uh, a complicated question around uh, time taken, especially if it's an intermittent absence situation, we would certainly want to get it uh, to the regroup and to our uh, lease specialist so we can have that conversation. I think high level, you know, the understanding we can make sure that the, the comp workers' compensation adjuster has is that for that time out of work, we are tracking that under the Family Medical Leave Act. And, um, and then we'll have a warm transfer capability. So if, if there is a, a question, we can make sure that it's addressed as quickly as possible. Thank you. How is IDM coordinated when work comp is in a state fund or monopolistic state? Well, it, so we would, it depends if it's being done by uh, the monopolistic fund or a state fund, then it depends. Is Corvell doing oversight or not doing oversight? If we're doing oversight, then we have very similar situations to what we've just described. I don't know, John, if there's anything you wanted to add on that. 
No, not really. I guess I would say what we try to do when it is in, uh, in this integrated product that we have with Corvell with other workers' compensation carriers, try to establish a, a, at least some information exchange. I think it gets harder when, to Diane's point, if it's a mon mon monopolistic state and uh, there isn't that desire to share. So I think it is state by state, case by case. But we'd, we'd love to get that information to make it as easy on your employee or the employee mm -hmm. as possible. Thank you. I assume you are able to interface with clients' electronic intake system. If this system is only used for workers' comp, can the intake be online with your system for the oxide? So I'm not sure I picked up yeah. all of that. We do yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, we're able to interface absolutely. I, both uh, both organizations have a very robust EDI uh, uh, system in place where we're able to take in information. So not a problem at all. Um, but if it's only, I'm not sure which system, the, your system as a client or our system. I guess I'm not, I, John, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think yeah. it was. Oh, excuse me, I'll clarify. I think that the yeah. interface is with the client's electronic system. So is there the ability to have the regroup in Corvell interface with the client's electronic system is my interpretation. Okay. So, I mean, we do, we do do that on a majority of our customers based on their size and, and work with many different HRIS uh, platforms. And so um, we would be able to do that. And I don't think at this point, depending on what the need is, that we would want to combine something as a feed. But I think, uh, Diane, maybe your position on how you do that on the non-OX side with integration with payroll or HR, HRIS. Yeah, if you think about it, and John, I'm thinking, and so I, I think that question, I was looking really quickly here in the chat pane so I wouldn't be distracted. But I think, um, Darren, if your question is, uh, Darren Cartwright, I think, wrote that question. But if if it is, say it's a it's an HR feed, and we want to get it so that when John calls, John can say, "Yes, I'm I'm John, and here's my street address." We can confirm, and we don't have to re-ask them all the information or the questions. The same thing happens. It doesn't. We'll share all that information uh, so that we make the user experience as easy and non-duplicative as possible. Yes, yeah, so he clarified, yes, our system as a client, system for oxide, but not a system for the non-oxide. How do you ensure employee satisfaction in cases where the incident starts out as an oc injury, but takes time to investigate to determine compensability? And during this time, the employee may not receive work comp or STD and be left for weeks without any compensation. Diane, since you're the beginning of that, because this is related to a workers' compensation claim, I'll let you start. Yeah, it, you know, obviously we want to be able to determine compensability as quickly as possible so that we're not leaving folks um, without any dollars coming in, in the door to put tuna on the table on Friday night, right? So we do try to do that as quickly as possible. Um, we also want to be sensitive uh, and work with our clients to make sure we gather as much information and detail as possible. Uh, the good news is that we're able to do this a little bit quicker because we get injuries reported much quicker, much quicker on the occupational side through the nurse triage program, the advocacy 24 seven program. So we've seen most of our clients have a very short and lag time. So employees that perhaps with a traditional TPA program may have been waiting for weeks and, and much for longer period of time, um, we're able to shorten some of that up as much as possible. But a lot of it is just good old fashioned claims administration and investigation and determining compensability as quickly and possible, as quickly as possible. Anything Thank you. to add, John? Mm -hmm. No, the only thing I, was, I would say there is if it's an employer, if the employer has that concern and this gets a little bit messy, there is the possibility you could, you know, pay on the non-ox side until that decision is made, but then you'd have to do some 
some moving of you know dollars into different buckets um so the, from my experience the good news is most jurisdictions have a fairly quick decision time or 21 days they don't you can't go six months some have pay without prejudice so at least you can start paying somebody and deny them later but in in some situation two to three weeks without you know a paycheck is very difficult so i think we'd have to talk about the next the question kind of parlays off that one okay Oh, I'm sorry, John. I, you, and I'm not sure if you no. ended or cut out. Did I interrupt? That's fine. You said it parallels no. off of this, so why don't we just go into the next yeah. question? If the employer doesn't offer salary continuance or STD, will a non-OC injury claim still be provided to Reed Group for absent management purposes? No, if we're not managing their formal, uh, formal short-term disability or salary continuation plan, that would not happen in, in this situation. It'd have to be something where Corvell would work with the employer to figure out how those situations would be handled. Do we have to purchase separate software program that integrates with our payroll HR? Uh, most of the time, from a non ox standpoint, at least, it's you know it's not so much software. It's it's the delivery of the backend file feeds in the format that you, the client needs to ingest into their HR, HRIS system. So a lot of that taking the information from our system when we're doing the administration and just getting it back into uh, the right way into their systems. Diane, anything on you from your standpoint? Yeah, and we, I think, yeah, for us, we pretty much just take whatever file format uh, most of our clients can give us, and we're able to accommodate their their standard file format. I'm not sure we've run into a situation where we've not been able to accommodate whatever the file format is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How do you keep abreast of state leads, and what guidance do you provide to employers in states with specific leads? leaves so from a non ox standpoint we have a uh, a large compliance department and we have folks that's all they do day in and day out is is make sure they stay abreast of any changes we have a blog we group has a blog that a compliance blog that anyone is um is op it's open to anyone it doesn't have to be a client from a client standpoint, we do a lot of work and working with the account executive to make sure we're keeping the client up to date on any changes and making the appropriate adjustments, be it to, to letters or process, et cetera, when things change. Okay, thank you so much. And with that, that appears to be our last question. I will turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Denise. Well, I would like to express my gratitude to our presenters today, Diane Blaha and John Lemire. And I would also like to thank Denise Meyer, our Senior Vice President of Sales for monitoring the chat plane. Uh, thanks to our marketing team for designing the presentation and handling all the invites. And I'd especially like to thank you, our audience today for attending our presentation and being engaged and asking lots of good, interesting questions. So with that, I'd like to wish everyone a very pleasant rest of their day and thank you very much for attending our call. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Stacy.